Welcome to the third. Welcome to the third and final, uh, for the time being at least, UKIS webinar. Apologies, we've been having some uh, some technical problems this morning, but uh, hopefully we're there now. So, welcome to the third and final UK Council for Internet Safety webinar. It's my pleasure to act as chair of this webinar. I'm Professor Julia Davidson. I'm Director of the Institute for Connected Communities at the University of East London, and I'm Chair of the UK Council for Internet Safety Evidence Group. I just want to tell you something first about the Evidence Group. We are a subgroup of the main UKIS committee, which is hosted by the DCMS. The Evidence Group consists of researchers from academia, charities and government departments. We make sure that the latest research evidence is presented to UKIS to inform policy, such as, for example, the forthcoming online harms legislation. We also run research webinars that consider policy and practice issues. Previous UKIS evidence group webinars have focused on young people online and mental health and online child sexual abuse. In this webinar, we will focus on adult online hate the UKIS Evidence Group published a literature review in 2019, which was funded by the DCMS, which explored a range of adult online harms, including image-based abuse and online stalking, the focus of our webinar today. We have a wide range of excellent speakers from different areas of practice and academia, and there will be some opportunity for Q&A by the chat facility later, but microphones are muted. Please see the speaker biographies in the packs as we will only briefly introduce the speakers. I'd like to start by handing over to our first speaker, Dr. Abhilash Nair from Aston University Law School to start the discussion. Thank you, Julia. I'm really pleased to be here um, at this um, third and final online adult harms webinar of the UKIS. Um, I think um, we've the UK has one of the most robust legislative and regulatory framework for child sexual abuse uh, imagery uh, in the world. But I get the feeling that we hadn't talked about adult online harms enough until very recently. We now have uh, law reforms in the horizon, so it's a very good thing. But it's also important that we create awareness among the public, we, we create a better understanding of what the real harms are as it affects adults as much as children. So in that sense, this, um, uh, this webinar is particularly topical, but also very timely. In terms of generating a better understanding of what the adult online harms are, there are two things to consider. One is at the basic level, we need to recognize the harms uh, that victims suffer for what they are. People often uh, have this misguided notion that because it's the internet and not the real world, the harms are less um, pertinent, the, the harms are less severe compared to the um, offline world. And I think could be farther from the truth. Because of the way we live in, in this connected world, digital world, the harms that victims suffer online, um, be it image-based abuse, online stalking, harassment, cyberbullying, they're very real with real impacts on, uh, impact on the victims. And it's important that we as a society recognize it, but it's also recognized by appropriate legal provisions being in place. The second aspect to consider is how we treat victims. And I don't think I'll be lying if I say that we still suffer from a culture of victim blaming. And that can be seen even something as basic as how we describe some of these harms. So the first session we've been looking at today focuses on image-based abuse. In common parlance, it is often referred to as revenge pornography, and it's important that we get the terminology right. Revenge pornography to describe what is legally defined as the non-consensual sharing of private images is problematic on multiple counts. It insinuates that victims have done something terribly wrong for somebody else to take an act of revenge, which is uh, also not appropriate. But it's also the case that revenge is hardly the motivation, the primary motivation in a number of cases where somebody redistributes a private image in order to uh, harm another person. 
And so in a literal sense, it is not appropriate at all. But also from a legal sense, there is nothing pornographic about somebody deliberately shaming or somebody deliberately causing harm by distributing what is essentially a private image. So there are scientific reasons, there are legal reasons, there are literal reasons why uh, the term is inappropriate. But also to get the term, such the terminology right, will also help us in forming a better understanding of the real problems so that we do not resort to the culture of victim blaming, we do not blame the victims for being victimized by somebody else. And that is really important for the laws to work because legislation is only the first step to addressing these problems. We need to have a collective understanding of what the problems are. Society needs to recognize that victims suffer real harm, which needs to be addressed in a proper sense. And that's precisely the point of today's uh, webinar. We've got two themes, so I will keep my talk rather brief and I would uh, leave, the, leave it to the experts to deliberate some of these issues in greater detail in the uh, sessions on image-based abuse, but also on online stalking. And with that, I declare this uh, webinar open. Thank you. Thanks very much, Apalash, for setting the scene for us and raising some important issues at the outset. I'd like to hand over now to uh, Dr. Nicholas Hogard and Professor Penny Lewis from the Law Commission. Uh, thanks very much, <coughs> Julia. Sorry, uh, I'm uh, unable to uh, use the video function um, because it's been disabled. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about our current project on intimate image abuse and then Nick Hoggard will uh, talk about online stalking. Uh, just briefly to introduce the Law Commission, we are the statutory independent body um, whose job it is to keep the law of England and Wales under review and recommend reform where it is needed. The aim of the Commission is to ensure that the law is fair, modern, simple and cost effective. Uh, we currently have uh, two projects relevant to today's topic. Uh, one is uh, the Intimate Image Abuse of project which is reviewing the law on the taking making and sharing of intimate images without consent so it is not limited to the disclosure offense or the so-called revenge pornography offense uh, we're currently consulting on, on our provisional proposals in relation to that uh, project and we'd very much welcome responses to our consultation which you can submit via our website uh, the consultation period uh, runs until the 27th of may and the link should be in the chat now. Um, once uh, we've uh, analyzed all of the consultation responses, we will report to Parliament with recommendations for reform by the end of this year. Now, if we think uh, briefly about the disclosure offense, um, we've looked at the offense to try to find out what is uh, working and what is not. So, uh, the problems we've identified are that the scope of images it covers does not include altered images such as deep fakes and uh, photoshopped images. It also doesn't uh, include images which are considered intimate within particular religious groups. Um, one of the big complaints we've heard from victims is that it is limited to cases where the prosecution can prove that the defendant intended to cause the victim distress and doesn't cover other possible uh, defendant motives. Um, the unavailability of ancillary orders and provisions uh, has also uh, been a, a big topic of complaint. So uh, victims of this offense do not have automatic anonymity, unlike victims of other sexual offenses. Um, special measures are not automatically available for them when they give evidence at trial and ancillary orders like sexual harm prevention orders and notification or uh, requirements to sign on the sexual offenders website are similarly not uh, available for this offense. And finally, and perhaps most topically, given that there's an amendment to the domestic abuse bill that would deal with this issue, the offense does not cover threats to share intimate images and those uh, that behavior can only be prosecuted under other non-specific offenses which are not fit for purpose. Uh, 
we've provisionally proposed an entirely new framework of offenses. We would uh, propose to repeal the disclosure offense and indeed the voyeurism and upskirting offenses and replace them with a base offense of taking or sharing an intimate image without consent. Two more serious offenses where that same behavior is uh, uh, conducted with either intent to humiliate, alarm, or distress the person depicted, or with intent to obtain sexual gratification, and a separate offense of threatening to share an intimate image. Um, we uh, have also provisionally proposed automatic lifetime anonymity for victims of all of these offenses, special measures to be available at trial, notification requirements and sexual harm prevention orders where appropriate. Uh, because the base offense is very broad, we've also proposed a defense of reasonable excuse. Uh, and uh, I'll just briefly mention how we've defined intimate images. Um, given that uh, I've just got a, a quite a short amount of time, I won't go into an enormous amount of detail, but we broadly defined images to include photos and videos, and we've identified four categories of intimate images, sexual, nude, semi or partially nude, and private images. Uh, we've uh, provisionally proposed to include in the uh, definitions of the sharing and um, threatening to share offenses to include in the definition of intimate image altered images such as deep fakes and photoshopped images so they would be covered under our provisional proposals and we've asked some questions of consultees about whether images that are considered intimate within particular religious groups should be included in intimate image offenses where the perpetrator was aware the image would be considered intimate by the person depicted. Uh, finally, for images that have previously been shared in public, say for example the person depicted shares a, uh, a semi-nude image of herself on her public Instagram feed, we've provisionally proposed, proposed to exclude those images where the victim consented to the previous sharing or the defendant reasonably believed that the victim consented to that previous sharing. Uh, I'll now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Hoggard, uh, who's the lead lawyer on the Harmful Online Communications Project, and he's going to talk about the relationship between that project and uh, online stalking. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, yes, the uh, this uh, project, the online communications project, um, is being sponsored by DCMS. Um, it's the it's looking at the sort of criminal law um, that sits alongside their regulatory regime, the online harms um, duty of care that they're proposing. We've been asked to look at the communications offences. That's the Malicious Communications Act and the Communications Act, plus a number of discrete areas. So we're looking, for example, at cyber flashing or the encouragement um, or incitement of self-harm. Ah, my, my video is now live. Um, how exciting for you. So um, we uh, had a consultation that ran for three months and that closed in December and we're hoping to publish our recommendations in the summer. Now, this project is obviously uh, not aspects of online stalking, which um, uh, clearly are not directly relevant to communications. However, there are um, a lot of different aspects of online stalking which are relevant to this project. Um, now, we don't consider that the current law addresses all of these particularly well. This is because, for example, under the Communications Act, you have to fit um, the behaviour into a, a sort of prescribed category or the communication into a prescribed category, such as grossly offensive or indecent or menacing. Um, this isn't always easy to do. We know there are, there are types of behaviour that we see in online stalking, which it might not be easy to describe as indecent um, or, or um, grossly offensive or objectively menacing. And to think of one example, um, if somebody uh, takes a photograph of the door of their ex-partner and sends it to that person such that that person then knows 
Yeah, Nick, perhaps it's best if you don't use the video. <laughs> All right, Nick, um, just to say you're, you're on mute, I think. Thank you, yes, yeah, sorry, I was, I, I was left the room briefly, but it seems that all is now well. Um, so there are a dozen adequately addressed the way we are proposing to deal with that is by repealing and replacing um, the uh, offences, the um, uh, communications, um, and we propose to replace this with a harm-based offence. So this, rather than having to fit the behaviour within a prescribed category such as grossly offensive, instead we would um, uh, have an offence that was predicated on the potential for harm hence a harm-based offence. Now this would be context specific. Um, it would uh, involve an assessment of what was likely to um, those who were likely to see it. Uh, we think that this will allow for um, a far greater range of prosecutions um, in those situations where prosecutions are currently uh, not possible. Um, we have also looked at a number of other specific offences. For example, um, we are considering proposing a specific offence of cyber flashing. Um, certain acts of cyber flashing do not fit well within the current law. Um, it can be difficult to prosecute for technological reasons um, or for motivation reasons. So we think that there needs to be a law that um, specifically addressed, addresses this act um, which uh, is, is prevalent, not just in online stalking, but in, in a range of um, behaviours uh, that the current law is, is not adequately addressing. Um, so I think for, for time reasons, I'll, I'll leave it there. But that's, that's really what we're trying to do is move away from universal standards in the law to a more context specific, a more context sensitive um, approach and thus allow for um, prosecutions where currently uh, that they may be um, restricted because of the wording of the law. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Nick, very much, and, and thanks, Penny. Um, very interesting um, potential changes to legislation outlined there. I was very interested in the idea of an inclusion of the harm-based offence, and also in the idea that uh, altered images such as deep fakes might be included in the legislation, but I'm hoping we can pick up on some of these issues in the panels that are coming up. And our first panel focuses on image-based sexual abuse and uh, moderated by Dr. Vicky Nash from the Oxford Internet Institute in discussion with Catherine Tremlett from Southwest Grid for Learning and Prof. Claire McGlynn from Durham University. Uh, over to you, thanks Vicky. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, I think we will kick straight off with our first speaker. Uh, so Catherine Tremlett is Harmful Content Manager at the Southwest Grid for Learning. Uh, and it's great to hear from her first because she has a hands-on experience of advising members of the public who've experienced intimate image abuse. So Catherine, over to you for eight minutes, please. Thanks very much, Vicky. And thank you very much for sharing, sharing the screen, Ruby. Um, I'll do a bit of a Chris Whitty and say next slide, please, at the relevant time. <laughs> Um, so the Revenge Porn Helpline, it's a bit of a troubling name, um, as, as Abilash has already explained, but I think I'll start by just saying that um, I'm the Harvard Contact Manager at Southwest Group for Learning. The Revenge Porn Helpline is run by my very esteemed colleague, Sophie Mortimer. Um, she's given me permission to talk about this topic today because it very much overlaps with the work that I do on the Report Harmful Content service that I manage. Um, so the helpline itself, is um, it was set up um, in 2015 when non-consensual sharing of private sexual imagery became a crime in the UK and it's government funded and essentially it's there to support any adult victim of intimate image abuse with the reporting and the removal of imagery. So next slide please. So we've talked about what intimate image abuse is 
Um, so I've just put the definitions up there, but wanted to tell you what the helpline does to support. So ultimately, we're there to provide non-judgmental support and advice to any client over the age of 18 um, with any issues they come up across in relation to these topics. Um, we help with the content removal and the reporting of that content and have a 92% success rate at removal of imagery with many industry platforms. And we offer a plethora of advice around social media reporting and also adult content sites and reporting on them. And we're the UK partner on the Facebook pilot, um, Not Without My Consent, which allows uh, victims of intimate image abuse or threats to share those images to be able to proactively report them and get them hashed and so that they're not shared on Facebook's suite of services. And uh, Next slide, please. So Abilash, very, uh, you summarised this beautifully in, in, in the introduction. Thank you for that. So I'm not going to uh, dwell on this for too long. Suffice to say that behind every image is a person and more often than not, that person is a woman. Um, and these women have had their most personal, intimate, private moments shared in a really public way. Um, and it, the crime has huge impacts on both emotionally and physically on any victims that this happens to. And often clients talk about the shame and embarrassment they feel. And we know that this terminology, revenge porn, is really problematic for them in the sense of the traumatization, but also in the sense of it doesn't really do justice to what they have actually suffered. No one should be blamed for what is happening to them. And we prefer to use terminology intimate image abuse or image based sexual abuse, which better reflects the true nature of the crime. So why don't we change our name then? Well, we don't change it because ultimately that's how the media and that's how government and that's how academics to a certain extent refer to this particular crime. And actually, if we know that victims want to find support, then they are going to search for revenge porn to find that support. So we're stuck in this middle of a situation where until it changes from the top, we can't really change our name and the helpline. Next slide, please. So what does the law say at the moment? Well, you can see there um, very much that summarises it in a nutshell. All I will add is that the domestic abuse bill is currently going through the Houses of Parliament, I believe it's at the Royal Assent stage, um, is going to add threats to share as an, an, a kind of official element. So that would hopefully make it much easier for victims of, who've had threats to be shared. Um, and next slide, please. So the impact of COVID, well, <laughs> I think it just says it all there really on that slide. So I'm not going to dwell again, um, just to let you read some of those figures. 600% increase in images reported since April 2020. It's huge. Um, and we've, we've increased the number of practitioners on the helpline over the year. Um, and I think just with more people being online, this is unfortunately is one of the negative outcomes of that. Okay, next slide, please. I wanted to place it as a gendered issue um, just to show you some of the statistics around why it specifically is a problem of male violence against women. And this again shows that I think the really poignant thing for me here is that 41.9 images per female client compared to 1.5 images per male client is a really important statistic. Statistic, I can't even say the word <laughs> statistic since the helpline began. Um, and actually, it just carries on to be. And then conversely, I think um, it's worth saying as well at this point that males are five times more likely to be victims of sextortion where the perpetrator is unknown. Um, so it, it does really, does really play, place that kind of onus on the female um, victim being more likely. And next slide, please. Um, and building on that point, uh, we talk often at our, um, in, in our helplines at Southwest Screen for Learning about the fact that actually um, all of these issues tend to not happen in isolation. The reason I'm giving this presentation today is because actually I work really closely with the Revenge Porn Helpline. In my own service, we have um, cross referrals between clients because very rarely is it a case that one of them would just be experiencing intimate image abuse in isolation. I think it's also worth to say that um, threats to share images are often used as a form of coercive control. 
and it prevents uh, to prevent people from leaving relationships and actually that's another issue which kind of comes up quite predominantly so it does sit very much within that kind of domestic violence framework next slide please and so to negate that then obviously we do have the service that i mentioned report harmful content where we can help and advise on some of the other harms that other people might be experiencing online um, and so we do have a lot of cross referral in that sense and i think i just wanted to let you know that obviously this so far this year 12 percent of all of our clients on report harmful content have noted intimate image abuse as being one of the harms that is happening to them in amongst all of these other things that might be going on and then just finally and nick and penny have summarized this as well but just from the victim's perspective this is what we see to be the problem with gaps in legislation i think one thing that wasn't necessarily mentioned there was around tri tribute images so we do see a lot of clients who come to us who've had their um, just head shots head and shoulder shots uh, maybe used for um, sexual gratification purposes predominantly again by men and then those images posted online obviously that is another huge privacy violation for those women and and um, a humiliating and degrading one um, i think i wanted also just to talk briefly about the fact that um with with regard to the uh the possible exception clause that's being proposed i think it, it um as at the moment there's an intention to cause distress which is obviously incredibly hard to to prove um, and I think there's an, um, an, a likelihood that the Law Commission have proposed that we maybe replace that with having a possible exception clause. Um, I think I would just advise proceeding on that with caution because obviously we can see the way that that might be exploited by perpetrators. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think I'll leave it there for today and, and thank you very much for my time. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I do think it's incredibly powerful to start with that because it is just such a stark reminder both of the scale of the problem and the incredible uh, distress and damage that this causes to individuals. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we applaud all the work you do at Southwest for learning on this. Um, let's move maybe though from the sort of the frontline response to uh, how we understand uh, this particular form of harm and perhaps also some sort of further thoughts about sort of the policy aspects of this. So our next speaker I'm going to bring in is Claire McGlynn, who is a professor of law at Durham University. Um, she has got particular expertise on this topic of sexual violence and image-based sexual abuse, both as an academic and also interacting in, in the policy world. Uh, and excitingly, as an academic, she's got a new book coming out this year on image-based sexual abuse, which, which I suspect lots of us are reading. So Claire, um, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for this uh, very timely seminar. Um, I think this webinar today, there's never been a better opportunity for us to be discussing these issues because change is possible. For the first time in many, many years, I feel positive that change could be possible this year. And I think we all need to be focusing on that and working towards that. And that's going to be what I'm thinking about in this presentation. Why this moment now? Well, we've just heard from Catherine about the prevalence of intimate image abuse. Over the last year of the pandemic, we've seen an exponential rise in online harassment. So we've heard from Catherine about the Revenge Porn Helpline. Other studies like the one by Glitch and End Violence Against Women, for example, also showed a rise in online abuse, particularly of women, particularly of black and minoritized women. So if this was an issue that policymakers, governments thought was not so significant and not so prevalent, we now cannot deny it and therefore action is needed. I think the other reason why this is really timely is again, over the last year, we've had more information and more cases and more stories about the breadth of these forms of abuse. Catherine has talked about many of these examples and I want to highlight one in particular. And I know the helpline has been dealing with this. And this is the kind of collector culture of intimate image abuse. This is where individuals, groups of men, are trading and sharing intimate images amongst themselves. Sometimes it's hacked images, taken without consent, shared without consent. Often the victims do not know that this is happening. We've known for many years that there are cases like this around the world, but in the last few months, we've had some of them closer to home. So now we're having to take much more notice of them. In Ireland, for example, last year, 
there was a, a very significant, rightly a huge scandal about thousands of images on uh, an internet fora that were there without consent. And this led to a great scandal and within a few months legislation was fast tracked and adopted that covers all forms of taking and sharing of intimate images. So that's what can happen. And then in the last few weeks, we've also seen some cases in the UK of these collector cultures with images being traded and shared. So we have to have this broad perspective of what we're talking about. And that does take us to this terminology issue. And I am going to raise it as well. And I make no apology for that because this is so significant. Abilash Nair referred to the fact that as law professors, we often talk about the significance of terminology because the revenge porn label limits our remit and scope. We're in this mess legislatively because of the dominance of the revenge porn narrative. That's what we have to remember and that's why we have to move beyond it. But it is about the victim perspectives as well. Catherine has talked about how uh, the language of revenge porn can often re-traumatize victims. So in other words, using this language revenge porn actively hinders and actively harms victims. They speak out and they tell us that this makes their shame and their self-blame worse. So in other words, we have to take that on board. Many of them say this is like the language that we don't use about, say, disabled persons, black and minority ethnic communities. So we have to take the same steps not to use this language about victims of intimate image abuse. It also, as Catherine and Abilash mentioned, better explains the experiences. Victims tell us that when they hear this terminology and language for the first time, it's like a light bulb for them. They feel understood and better recognized because there's a label that accurately describes what's happened to them. So we do need to listen to victims, understand their perspectives, understand what's, what they're telling us, not actively harm them. And it's not actually that difficult. So again, if I take you to Ireland before Christmas, in the scandal and the legislative debates that followed, almost universally, the language of intimate image abuse or image-based sexual abuse was used by policymakers, by the media. Australia uses language image-based abuse consistently. So we can make this change and we must make this change now more than ever. It's not up to the revenge porn helpline to do that, as Catherine said, it's up to the rest of us. And now is the time to actually do it. So that takes me to the law reform issues. And we've heard from the Law Commission about their consultation on this. Hugely welcome consultation, comprehensive report, recognizes the fundamental harms and problems that we face in this area. I want to think about one particular aspect of that uh, report, and it is around this issue of motivations for actions by perpetrators. As Catherine and others have mentioned, current law requires proof of an intention to cause distress. We know from police, we know from victims that this limits and hinders uh, prosecutions. And the Law Commission have recommended a base offence that does not require that motivation, which is very welcome. They do, however, as was mentioned, recommend a quote, more serious offence where motivations around sexual gratification or intention to cause distress and potentially more can be proven. I want to caution us against introducing a hierarchy of offences of this nature. First of all, I'm concerned it creates a hierarchy amongst victims with some being told that their offence is the more serious one than others who ha may have experienced very similar harms. I'm also concerned, going back to the collector culture I mentioned, that if we enshrine in the law this hierarchy, we are already perhaps going to be out of date in terms of our understandings about the motivations for these offences. And the collector culture is just one aspect of that, because it's not necessarily about an intention to cause distress, and it's not necessarily about um, uh, sexual gratification either. I'm also concerned it's going to overly complicate the law. 
one of the problems we know of the current law is it's fiendishly complicated. It's different legislation in different places, different thresholds for different circumstances. And I worry that we're introducing here a complication that's not necessary. So motivations, yes, they're important, but they're important, I think, for sentencing, not at this stage of the drafting of the offence. What else do I think needs to happen? I think we also need to consider a holistic response. This is our opportunity. And that means civil law options. We'd have, for example, a statutory civil offense for harassment in the Protection of Harassment Act. I think we should do something similar with intimate image abuse. We also need more orders that courts can impose, civil orders to take down images to prevent distribution. The other possibility at the moment, why this is such an important moment, is we hope to see the online harms bill coming before Parliament. If that legislation is to be truly landmark, as the government hopes, it must have teeth and it therefore needs revision. We must have power to get images taken down by the regulator. We must hold porn companies particularly and social media, co media companies to account and hold them responsible stronger than the terms that are in the draft legislation and the draft bill than at the moment. So to conclude, this is our moment of change, but I want to emphasize that it won't just happen. Five years ago, legis uh, proposals were introduced in Parliament to amend legislation to grant anonymity. Five years later, many attempts have been made to change that legislation, but we're still waiting. So we cannot just expect this to happen. We have the experience of recent years with survivors speaking out. The evidence has been gathered. The case for change is being made. Now we must all redouble our efforts, myself included, this is to me too, if we're going to make this change and make the most of this moment that I hope we can do. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire, so much for that incredibly impassioned uh, uh, explanation of why we need to focus on this uh, with, with much greater intent uh, and energy right now. Um, so we've got time now for some questions before we move to the next panel. So I would encourage anybody who's listening who has a question for, for either of uh, my current speakers, Claire and Catherine, or perhaps even for, for Nick, I'm hoping to bring him in as well. Just pop those either in the chat or the Q&A. Q&A is easy for me to see, but pop them in either. I'm keeping an eye on both. Um, in the meanwhile, though, I mean, I, I am really interested in this question of how we, you know, if, if we are intent on changing the law now to really make a difference that we need to get it right, we, you know, we can't afford to do this and have to revise it again in five years time. Both of you picked up on this question about intention as being really quite problematic. And I, I'd just like to hear a bit more about that, if that's okay. So both, why is this, why is this problematic? Uh, and, and what would you like perhaps to see in its place? So maybe, Catherine, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Vicky. And um, yeah, I think in terms of uh, from a, from from thinking about it from a really practical point of view, um, if if someone says that they didn't intend to cause a victim distress by sharing that image, then uh, they're not saying that they're off the hook, but they're quite close to being off the hook because how do you prove that they weren't? <laughs> um, so I suppose in in really practical terms, what we see is that there is very low prosecution rates for this particular crime at the moment, and in part that is because that intention to prove that they intended to cause distress um, is really problematic. And I think I, yeah, I just wanted to talk more about the possible exception clause. Um, so I think that there is a proposal and, and Nick, um, Penny, please jump in. Um, where if the defendant believes he, she or they have a reasonable excuse to share the content, so for instance, legal reasons, medical reasons, or educational or scientific reasons then there might be an, an exception. Um, and I suppose knowing the perpetrator behaviour and how that has evolved over the last, uh, well, since 2015, and this became a criminal offence, we know that um, people will work their way around this and, and make a, make a, you know, a valid attempt at trying not to get prosecuted. And I can just see that there is that, that possibility of it being abused by those people who will want to abuse the system. That's really clear. No, thank you. I think that really does make it sort of so obvious why, why, why this would be a sort of a really poor step forward. Claire, do you want to add to that? Or do you want, I mean, you also mentioned, you know, another problem is around this idea of there being a hierarchy somehow of intimate image abuse offence offences and, and that again is really 
uh, interesting too. Do you want to say a bit more about that, that as well, perhaps? Yeah, yes, I guess just to just to add on to that, I think um, just for those who may be not so familiar with some of the elements of the criminal law or sexual offences law, the, uh, this requirement for certain motivations is unusual in the criminal law and in sexual offences law. Most sexual offences, if you think of you know, rape, etc., don't require proof of a particular motive. Um, and the seriousness of the offence comes down to, to sentencing. And, and that's the same in many criminal offences. So although you have a distinction like murder, manslaughter, that's not based on the motivations of the perpetrator, why they did something. It's about the intention to do the those particular acts so it, it's also slightly I think out of kilter with other with other offenses and I think it also undermines what I think we need to focus on in all of these activities is non-consent that's the key and, and I think that's the message that's important for education and I think if we then focus on too many of these other aspects we we narrow we you know we, we don't focus enough on that core wrong of non-consent no, that's really, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's right. It's interesting that there is such an asymmetry there. I'm just wondering, we both wonder whether Nick wants to come in or not. He may, he may not have the ability to do so, but Nick, it feels like holding a seance. Are you there? Would you like to? <laughs> I, I am here. I confess that um, this, is, this is not, the, the um, Intimate Image Abuse Project is not my project. I mean, the, um, so I, I, I can't really talk to that. I think uh, where, what does fall within the remit of, of my project is um, cyber flashing. Um, which is, is clearly a form of intimate image abuse, um, albeit that it doesn't necessarily involve sharing the image of, of the victim survivor in this sense. But um, I think one of our considerations here is that we, we want to be able to capture um, the behaviour that is culpable. Um, and one way of doing that um, is by using motivation. So, so uh, it's important that you have um, in, in the form of intimate images, a, a base offence. But I think the idea with including motivations is that um, you are able to um, sentence at a higher level that behaviour which is more culpable, um, and it's more culpable um, based on the motivation. So it's not about um, distinguishing different harms necessarily. You know, the acknowledgement is the harm is fundamentally the same regardless of the motivation, but there is a way of um, ensuring that the offences adequately describe the culpability of the offender as well as recognising um, the harm of the victim survivor. Um, but I, I say that only as a, as a generality, obviously I can't comment on, on the um, proposals within the Intimate Image Abuse Project, so apologies for that. That said, I'm quite certain we can provide um, a, a written view, and indeed there is a, a published consultation paper as well, if, if um, more evidence would be required. That, that, that's excellent, thank you. And just one quick clarification, actually one of our um, attendees asks, what is cyber flashing for the purposes of this, of this legal change? Um, it's, a, it's a good question, and um, I, I suppose answering that without also uh, um, answering in very legal terms is quite difficult, but the, the way we um, conceive, of, conceive of cyber flashing um, is that it is the um, sending of um, an image that, of genitalia um, to another person, and in the paradigmatic sense this normally involves um, where there has been no consent from the other person. Often we know it involves the images uh, of the sender's genitalia, but this isn't always the case. Um, it happens in a variety of contexts. Oh, sorry, can, can you hear me? We can hear you again. If you just repeat oh, that good. last couple of sentences, please. Thank you. Yes, of course. Sorry. Um, it happens in a variety of contexts. Um, one of the classic examples um, is on public transport where um, people are using airdrop to send these images to people, but, but that is not the only um, instance we've heard uh, a number of um, people talk about um, their sitting in theatres, for example, and having somebody send um, images to them. So yes, it, it, is, it is a form of exposure um, but it doesn't necessarily always involve the sender's genitalia um, uh, and is normally without, well, we, we see that the examples that we have um, involve uh, no consent on the part of the recipient. So it's not about sharing an image of the victim survivor necessarily, it's about sharing an image of genitalia, whoever's that is.
thank you for clarifying that. It is, it is an area where it is right for terminology, so it is really quite important, I think, to unpack some of this. Um, Nick, uh, Nick, I'm going to let you off the hook for a moment. I'm going to go back to Claire and Catherine and look at some of the other questions that are coming in. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Claire, in fact, this question is probably more for you. So it's a question for, for, for Delene from, from South Af uh, on, on South Africa, um, asking about how these things are best dealt with in terms of legislation. So she says, in South Africa, we've provided for a civil protection order for stalking online and offline under the umbrella of cyber harassments. Some parts of the stalking don't amount to offences. We have new law and disclosure for data message of an intimate image and harmful disclosure of pornography under the headings of cybercrime and the films and publications legislation. So are different aspects not best dealt with in very specific legislation? Um, so there's sort of fragmentation versus so sort of centralization here. Uh, yes. I mean, obviously, I, I can't actually speak to the very specifics of the law in in South Africa, but I, I guess what I can see is one of the reasons why uh, there is a law commission inquiry at the moment and that runs to 400 pages is because we have in England and Wales very fragmented legislation in this area. Um, and it does become very confusing for for all of us to, you know, to try and to try and work things out. So. Ideally, I think now that we now that there is a field, if you like, around intimate image abuse, we know that there's this range of behaviours. I think bringing together a comprehensive piece of legislation covering those behaviours is is a good way forward, and that's also because it labels and names them, and and that's part of the power, I think, of the criminal law. Uh, I think it's, you know there's an awful lot of perpetration and victims in this field and not all of them are going to even want to use the criminal law but adopting a criminal law with the right labels does help you know us all in society understand a harm and what's going on and victims know that something's happened to them um, and that they can do something about it and so that's also the power of having this specific legislation tackling a particular issue. That's brilliant thank you. Um, a question probably for both of you now, and then I'll get Catherine maybe to answer first this time. Um, but if you ask how you feel about the, the move towards things like end-to-end -end encryption, obviously across many platforms, but in particular in relation to Facebook at the moment, how do you both feel about that? So Catherine, what are you expecting to see as a result of that? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Thanks, Laura. Um, obviously, I think she's alluding to the fact that obviously we and uh, the Revenge Porn Helpline are the UK partners as a Not Without Your Consent project at Facebook. And at the moment that helps um, support victims from having their intimate images shared in the first place by hashing images which are proactively sent on, on to Facebook through the Revenge Porn Helpline. Um, and, and obviously it stops them being shared across platforms. End-to-end -end encryption in really simple terms would stop the ability for that to happen. Um, it doesn't happen on WhatsApp at the moment because it's already end-to-end -end encrypted. So if they do bring in end-to-end -end encryption in messenger services, then yes, that does have quite a, poten uh, a potentially huge impact. Um, but what I will say is that obviously we're working very closely with Facebook to, to try and negate what happens in that instance. And, and we have our own, um, you know, uh, we have our own conversations all the time around how we can negate that risk and how we can make sure that moving forward that the project is still fit for purpose and is still able to support victims. Yeah, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Claire, does it raise any particular concerns from a legal perspective? Um, I, I think as many others who, who are more expert on the specifics of the end-to-end -end encryption have said though, it's going to make it even more difficult to, to bring some prosecutions in some cases, and particularly when we're talking about child grooming and child sexual abuse images. It's a, it's a real concern. Yeah. I'm unmuted. Um, I'm wondering if I have, Elena, do I have time to ask one more question? Go for it, I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there was a great question here um, from, uh, actually, no, they're, they are, I think, uh, I know it's from Daniela. Um, interesting talks, learning lots from it, um, really picking up on the fact that this term, revenge, this term revenge porn is so damaging. How can we encourage lay people to stop using this term? You know, who, whose responsibility is it? How can we all contribute to, to getting rid of this term? So quick answer for both Catherine and Claire, please. Okay, do you want me to go first, Claire? <laughs> um, right, from my perspective, it's about um, how you can just uh, support victims of intimate image abuse. So never blame the victim, make sure you use the correct terminology, think about the, under understand the impact of the crime that it has on the victim. Um, offer them reassurance, 
and make sure that they are aware that practical solutions are available to them. They can signpost to places like the Revenge Porn Helpline for advice and support. Um, and it's just about creating awareness of intimate image abuse or image-based sexual abuse, whichever term you use, it's about creating that awareness and making sure that you're using it in your own terminology, in your own language, um, and train your staff and share that information with your colleagues. Call them out if they start using that terminology so that we can start in building it into our society response to this. Absolutely, um, we can put it to that. Claire? Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, the responsibility of uh, people, you know, who have um, a voice, say in the media, politicians particularly, policy makers, and uh, so it's there for about having awkward conversations. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, um, yeah, sometimes having to go, like, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to raise this again. And, and in my experience with the media, sometimes that means they don't bring you on the programme. Um, but uh, you know that that's what sometimes I think we have to we have to deal with. We, and if we all keep trying and keep moving forward, we will change things definitely. No, I agree. We went through the same issue with with child pornography, changing that terminology. And I think that has now become much less acceptable. So yeah. yeah, everybody, please play your part, get rid of this terminology. Claire, Catherine, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, and I'm going to hand back to Elena for the next section. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, with your permission, Julia, I'll just take over if that's okay to start introducing our next panel. Uh, we're going to follow the same kind of model, really. Um, this panel looks at the problem of stalking, a, a chronic and persistent crime that uh, poses significant risk to individuals and require a lot of engagement between a uh, police team and selected partners, both to manage the perpetrator and safeguard and protect the victims. So it's my pleasure to welcome um, two great speakers and really key uh, practitioners in this area. We've got uh, Dr. Uh, Emma Short, she's an Associate Professor in Psychology at Montfort University, um, and Saskia Garner, a Senior Policy and Campaigner um, at the Susie Lampler um, organization. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start with Emma, if that's okay. I know that you're planning to give us a kind of a, an overview of uh, the issue that we're facing. Over to you, Emma. Okay, and I think there are some slides that go with this. So um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I think it's a really timely webinar, as you've said. It's, you know, the, all of these things rarely happen in isolation and it's great to bring these two things together. So I'm gonna reflect a little bit on learnings from some research over about the last 15 years and also trends that we've noticed um, since lockdown. So if you go to the first slide, uh, yeah, okay. Um, what is stalking? Well, it's a pattern of fixated uh, behaviour. It's repeated. It's directed towards one individual from another and it, it raises real distress and fear. I think it's probably best understood using the acronym that was launched in the police campaign about a year ago. If you look at behaviour that is fixated, i.e. it's stuck, it's unchanging, the motivation is not moving, the intent continues. If it's obsessive, i.e. if you continue to see an enormous amount of preoccupation in the individual, um, enormous investment of time given to the behaviour. If it's unwanted, if it's repeated, you know, that's a really good way of summing up stalking behaviour and it makes it quite easy to recognise. It's experienced as a chronic um, campaign of conduct that is often very long lasting. Research indicates that the average length of a stalking um, case is about two years in terms of that course of conduct against one another, against another person. Often victims of it only report after a hundred unwanted intrusions. So it's already chronic by the time it's ever presented. It's also prevalent. The crime survey for England and Wales indicates that one in five women and one in 10 men will experience stalking during their lifetime. So this is not a rare crime. If we go to the next slide, please. Let's have a look at what's been happening um, during lockdown. Overall, there is clearly an increase in you know, the crimes we've been talking about today, the offences we've been talking about today. Um, stalking is very much among those. Police reports indicate 110% rise. Services who support um, people who are experiencing or suffering stalking also have reported huge increases. So the National Stalking Helpline has reported huge increases. But it's also included that 
100% of the people experiencing stalking during lockdown have reported a cyber element. 49% of those who are already being stalked also confirm this increase in online behaviours. So while this is an emerging pattern um, of increase, it's also reflecting patterns that were there pre-pandemic. So this is not something that's going to go away. It's not something that's going to go away because it was already evolving, but also individuals who are stalking others have adopted these skills and been applying them. Why would they abandon them now? So it's something we need to keep as a high level of concern. There are also the changes in the digital behaviour methods. The most common methods remain the most common methods, really. Those ones that come in through the front door in terms of direct messaging, messaging to accounts that are open to communications. There's also sort of drift to um, threats and things so on in the workplace as we've been working online more. In terms of evolution, there have been some changes in terms of the increase of tracking technology. Um, again, the unmasking stalking report that was launched in National Stalking Awareness Week last week reports the increase of things like tracking technology, which has increased by about 10 times. Image-based sexual abuse, we've talked about that. Yes, clearly, I've got here a doubling in cases during the month of April 2020, but I've already heard from, from um, the previous presentations, I'm looking at 600% rise. I'm linking this because of the links to stalking. In a piece of work published earlier this year, for example, people who were surveyed after having had experience of image-based sexual abuse, out of those, 52% of them indicated that it was part of a wider course of conduct that may have amounted to stalking. So clearly, these are new tools being adopted in cases of stalking. If we go to the next slide, thank you. Let's have a look at that impact. We've talked about the fact that often the impact's overlooked. I would say it's an added impact in stalking. The major risks remain, i.e. the persistence of the abuse, the, the bombardment of abuse or intrusions, the recurrence of it, the disruption to life, um, and also sort of the possibility of violence. But add to that the nature of the online space and the reactivity of online environments. What that does is create a sense of omnipresent threat for victims in that they're never offline. You know, you are available or accessible through digital means, through Wi-Fi enabled means, as well as physically um, perhaps feeling vulnerable. So that's increased. There's also the idea of the penetration on the scale of broadcast. So when abuse is posted, the implications for reputation, for the disruption or even the, the shattering of social networks is increased enormously. So all of that is going on, there's that added impact, but there's also that increased barrier to reporting because as we've said, it's not often taken as seriously or recognised as quickly. So as well as to police and public inconsistency in the way we accept its, its impact, it's a block, it's a block to reporting. There's also the ideas about the wider social space. When abuse or stalking intrusions are public, you can increase things like secondary abuse, like virtual mobbing, even the incitement of harassment where that isn't a single pylon, but other people adopt a course of conduct towards that same person who's being targeted. And widely it has that chilling effect, i.e. we see this abuse or we see how dangerous it can be for certain individuals online and it suppresses potential supporters. So let's move on to the last main slide and that's thinking about the challenges that we face. Firstly, I would say identification remains a problem. In work that I've been fortunate to do with um, Eleanor at Middlesex and her team, um, you know, we are still finding that officers are less confident in recognising um, harmful cyber stalking behaviours. So getting in the front door in order to get support or justice can still be quite challenging if your stalking has happened entirely online. So same for risk assessment, there isn't consistent risk assessment of harmful cyber behaviours. How is everyone going to recognise when that threshold of risk is being reached? From research that I did with um, Police Innovation Funded Project, one of the key things that came out was the problem of evidence collection. There aren't consistent methods um, or standards really for cyber evidence in terms of stalking. And also the 
the main way it's collected is by removal of devices from people who've already been victimized and working and interviewing um, a number of people who've experienced it the reluctance to hand over even more control when they have been stalked and feel a real threat to their control and integrity is something that creates great reluctance there's also the problem of placing the burden of evidence collection on people who are experiencing stalking if we're asking them to capture everything that happens to them. So this is something that really needs to be discussed um, and improved. So overall, there are some inconsistent cyber skills. There are pockets of incredible expertise as well. And my suggestion is very strongly that there's more transmission, there's greater transmission from these expert pockets right down to the front line of policing. On a practical level, I would also like to see more discussion and recognition about the need for accreditation for independent technical specialists. Very often, people who are experiencing stalking are asked to give your phone to a technical specialist, see what they can find out if it's been hacked. How do we approach these people? How do we identify trusted outlets? It's something I think we need to have a conversation about. And finally, the absolute necessity of understanding in a broad way the impact of tech abuse on people who it's happening to the increased amount of trauma caused by that omnipresent threat um, and the barriers to reporting is enormous so trauma-informed practice is something that is more important now than it has ever been so that's that's me thank you very much Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. And uh, we've invited to come along to this webinar also Saskia, as I mentioned, who brings the kind of a practical experience uh, to this forum to talk about the work that she's been doing with victims of stalking. Um, Saskia, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'd really like to tell you very briefly a bit about the Susie Lampley Trust and the work we do um, with stalking victims and the National Stalking Helpline. Um, I think there are a few slides coming, that's great. Um, so if we um, go on to the next slide, just very briefly for those of you who don't know, um, Susie Lampley was in fact um, an estate agent. Um, she went to meet a client um, in, in the the course of her uh, working day um, and at some point during that day her colleagues realized that she um, had not returned to the office and was essentially missing um, and so it was some hours later really that um, the police were alerted to the fact that um, nobody knew where she was um, and in fact um, tragically Susie's body was never found her, um, nobody will ever know exactly what happened to her uh, but um, amazingly, really, the legacy um, of Susie is that her parents set up the Susie Lampley Trust within months of her disappearance to, um, to raise awareness of personal safety issues, but also stalking. There was some evidence that Susie may have been stalked in the lead up to her disappearance. And her parents really strongly felt that more needed to be done to raise awareness of, of issues of violence and aggression in society and how we can all work together to uh, minimise those. So we, um, that slide is actually slightly out of date. We're now in our 35th year. Um, uh, so we'll be um, sort of acknowledging um, Susie's anniversary in July um, and looking back at the, some of the work we've done. So if you can move on to the next slide, just briefly, talk about the kind of work that we've done and, and then how that relates to the online um, discussion today. Um, so on the support side we as I said run, run the National Stalking Helpline, we support over 4,000 victims of stalking every year. Um, we can't possibly answer all the contacts um, that are, are made um, to our helpline. Unfortunately, the demand um, is ever increasing. But we do our absolute best to respond and provide advice. We also have an online tool that people can go online and understand if the behaviors they're experiencing are in fact stalking. Um, as Emma quite clearly outlined, that kind of fixation and obsession and people sometimes suffer um, multiple incidents before they understand what's happening to them when we try and raise awareness about um, seeking help. On the education side, we run um, training for employees and employers to better keep their staff safe at work, particularly around loan working, but also uh, recognising stalking and providing um, advice in the workplace. And then on the, on the campaigning side, we carry out research, surveys, trying to understand the issues um, at the forefront of um, stalking, 
uh, harassment, violence and aggression, and of course trying to influence policy and legislation where we think that is due. Um, and just quickly to mention before I get into the stalking specifically, we did run a survey um, for our National Personal Safety Day in November looking at the prevalence of a range of online harms, including cyber stalking, but also more broadly um, trolling, bullying, um, some of the um, behaviours that we've discussed already today and we were really alarmed to find that 30% um, of respondents said they were experiencing online harm at work and this is during the pandemic of course we're all you know um, working at home that those kinds of barriers are being breached there's no uh, boundaries around those behaviours um, and 80% of those people said that those um, behaviours had increased during during lockdown so I think we, we really are facing um, a sort of tidal wave of, of these kinds of behaviours coming forward really. Um, so if we can look at the next slide, just want us to think really now about the, the specific motivations for perpetrators, uh, particularly around online stalking. We know how difficult this can be to detect, but really then how that impacts on victims. Um, why why stalk online? Why, you know, why is this preferable? We know that, that um, Emma said now, um, you know, we see on the helpline that this, this element of stalking is, is rapidly increasing. Well, you know, everybody carries a phone. It's very easy to perpetrate these kinds of behaviours where, wherever um, the stalker might happen to be. That that device is always available. Um, it doesn't take much effort on their behalf. Once they have um, got access to social media accounts and so on, to start um, intimidating and um, stalking those victims on a sort of consistent basis, really. Um, it's also extremely concerning the extent to which perpetrators are able to find personal information about a victim online and many people aren't aware for instance that if they've been on a public electoral roll their, their address might be um, publicly available if they have a public facing job um, they can be found online events that they may be about to uh, speak at uh, videos of them you know all this kind of information is so easily accessible um, now to build up a picture of a victim and also their um, their patterns of behaviour, um, both both physically but also online. Um, for instance, we know there's been an increase in behaviours such as unauthorised access to victims' accounts. So this is another way of stalking and intimidating um, access to their financial um, to, to bank accounts and um, ordering goods through accounts they might have online, such as Amazon and so on, um, posing as the victim in order to to sell services, possessions, um, and we know that um, this can also be used to subscribe to services which cost money and therefore have an economic impact on victims. So there's a whole range, it's, it's just impossible to encapsulate here, that the range of tools and behaviours that perpetrators can and do use to stalk victims and I think um, what, what we've all been talking about is better recognition of this within the law and that and that that, that range of behaviours is is really really crucial here and, and more importantly the impact on the victim and we know again that this can be used to damage the reputation of the victim um, both in their work um, in their workplace but also personally um, sending of viruses, spamming, all these kinds of uh, behaviours we know um, are used unfortunately by perpetrators. If we can look at the next slide, just a few quotes here from our recent report um, that we we launched last week during National Stalking Awareness Week about the impact on mental health, which is really, um, really distressing. Um, 49% uh, of respondents to that survey said that the um, that stalking had uh, the impact of stalking had worsened their mental health during the pandemic, and there's a whole range of reasons for that. People feeling more isolated, the intensification of those those stalking behaviours, as Emma was saying, that all pervasive. Um, sense of being watched at all times, not knowing if your webcam's been um, being tampered with, your phone, your car. Um, obviously, there's a whole range of smart technologies now that increasingly are being um, manipulated and hacked into uh, by perpetrators. And this, therefore, impacts a whole range of in a whole, in a whole range of ways for a victim, both the physical threat of violence through um, through uh, online means and um, you know we can, we know that leads to death threats and so on but also the emotional impact um, 
not knowing if their families are going to be impacted, not knowing if their children are at risk. Um, and also that sort of mental health aspect. And we know from previous studies that, um, you know, up to 80 percent of, of, of victims of stalking show um, show symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and yet a very small amount of people get assessed for that when they go to a doctor and so on and report these kinds of behaviours. So I just want to quickly talk through a case study to sort of exemplify really the, um, the per pervasive nature um, of how technology can be used um, to stalk an, a particular individual. If we could go to the next slide. Um, this, this person's name has been changed for obvious reasons, but this is a real case um, that came through our helpline. Um, so this was a case of a stalking perpetrator who um, was not in fact identified. The assumption was that he probably wasn't known to the victim. However, he was able, um, sorry, the, the person, we're assuming it's a he, but um, um, the person was um, able to send uh, over 6,000 emails over a period of several years. Uh, the sending of sexually explicit images, questions, um, you know, really intrusive communications. Her webcam was hacked and um, the stalker posed as a friend or a family member on several occasions to get information about her children from their school and also from social services. Um, that the stalker was able to contact a number of um, the victim's um, friends, trusted contacts to try and access her through those means. That the, the perpetrator managed to put her house up for sale. He also put her, um, ident her identified her on a number of websites um, that suggested she was available um, to, to sell for sexual services, uh, dating sites, um, she, she was spoken about on the radio um, and perhaps most disturbingly um, she would get messages when lights went out in certain rooms in her house or when she went for a shower or indeed when the police visited her house so she knew that her every move was being monitored um, and yet she had no idea who this person was because the, 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 the pre predominant behaviours were online um, and even though there wasn't a specific threat of violence, the alarm and the distress, I think we can all appreciate from these examples was just so immense and so utterly devastating. The trauma was so all encompassing that we just cannot underestimate um, the impact of these behaviors on, on victims, um, even if they are um, predominantly on, online. Um, and um, we are recognising that trauma in piloting um, a trauma-informed response um, to victims who come on our, our helpline. We are training our advocates in this approach and it's had a very positive um, response so far. So um, I, I think I'll finish there. Um, just to say, I mean, as far as sort of recommendations and what we what we do moving forward, um, and that we have a number of recommendations coming out of our report last week. Um, not least um, calling on a national task group to look at the appallingly low conviction rates for stalking um, and of, of course wider war crimes as well I think we'll all recognise um, but also the desperate need for better training within the criminal justice system to recognise these behaviours and support victims from a very early stage and of course um, better funding for frontline services to really support victims and ensure that they're getting the support they need so happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Saskia. Thank you, Emma. Um, you brought to light so many interesting information there about stalking and the, the trauma and the psychological terror that it really has on victims of stalking. So can I just start with um, a question, really, a very simple one that can be very useful to anyone attending here. So what does a person need to do if they realise that they've been stalked? I'm happy to start. Um, yes, that's like, good. Go um, well, as I say, um, some people are uncertain as to whether what they're experiencing is stalking, but we would say to anyone who thinks, who feels remotely unsafe or that the behaviours may constitute, um, you know, really only takes a one or two incidents of unwanted um, uh, behaviour and, and that can be enough to um, certainly tell a trusted contact. But um, ideally get um, expert help and, and our advocates on the National Stalking Helpline would really 
help to work through those behaviours and understand what was going on and also highlight potential risks and how those could be mitigated. But of course, anyone who felt um, immediately unsafe, uh, should we would always recommend that they, they report to the police immediately um, and that, you know, hopefully some protections could be put in place um, to prevent uh, certainly physical, but, but also online contact from that person if that's making them feel unsafe. unsafe. Thank you. Emma, what would you say to that question? Okay, I, I think it's a really good question and I think it's one of the reasons why the Susie Lamp Who's Trust campaign about four or five years ago was called Trust Your Instinct um, because many people have a gut feeling that what's happening to them feels unsafe, they feel afraid, but it's hard to name it. So I think Trust Your Instinct is really, really important. I would totally support what Saskia says there. If you feel unsafe immediately, ring the emergency services. But if you want support and reflection in trying to name what's happening to you, there is an online tool that Susie Lamprey Trust has. If you don't want to commit to a phone call, if that feels a step too far, there's also the Cyber Helpline um, and their website, um, which again enables you to do an online assessment of what's happening to you. So if it feels too much to speak to someone, there are online tools there that are very helpful. Thank you. I've got another question from Lynn, who's asking, um, uh, she's stating that uh, stalking clearly covers all domestic abuse aspect, uh, but what's the ratio um, of stalking by partners and ex-partners compared to non-partner? Uh, because, you know, when you think of stalking, you imagine that mm -hmm. uh, usually it's someone that you know well, someone that is close to you. Uh, what's your experience? Well, what's the ratio there? Just um, speaking from um, the, the victims that come through our helpline, um, it's about around 55% are ex-intimate partner um, stalk stalking perpetrators um, and around 45% are non-ex-partner. So that could be anything from um, somebody who's completely unknown to you to an acquaintance, maybe a neighbour, maybe a work colleague, um, friend of a friend, whatever. So not not sort of that, that ex-partner, if you like. Um, but um, yes, it's, it's amazing the extent to which it can be perpetrated by people who you haven't necessarily had a relationship of any kind with also, although that does, um, that's obviously a significant um, number of the cases as well. So how can that someone that you don't know become so fixated and obsessed with a person? How does that happen, Emma? Would you mind to explain the, the process there? Oh gosh, that's a really, really tough one. <laughs> in a couple of minutes. Um, sometimes it's people who are called identified strangers. So it might be someone that you see again and again, like someone who works in a shop, for example, um, or your doctor or your GP. So someone that's a stranger, but you identify with um, and become fixated with them. Um, there are lots of other reasons why as well. There is a there is an argument that we're all public figures now, for example. So if we've got a very strong media profile, there might be something that appeals to people in the same way that celebrities become quite fanatic. Um, I'm sorry, fans of celebrities become quite fanatic about them. So there's an argument that that might be um, one of the things now that, that causes strangers to fixate on other strangers. Um, in terms of the demographics that you were talking about, that's also interesting, I think, with cyber, because research does suggest, again, the, the sort of 55% split with other people being family, strangers, work colleagues, and so on. Um, but some online research has got a bigger chunk of people who are unknown and never identified. And that's one of the reasons why I think we've got to push the cyber skills, because my thinking is some of these people will be strangers and some will be ex-partners who have anonymized themselves and we know that they're some of the riskiest stalkers in terms of escalation to violence so we've got to up those cyber skills and identify those unknown cyber stalkers thank you i think i have time for a very final question if i may and this is for saskia i think um, so from the research that we with Emma and colleagues we've conducted um, on, uh, on stalking, it emerged that the perpetrators often use intimate image to threat their victims. What's your experience um, at the Suzy Lampla Trust? Well, we do see that in some cases, although I have to say um, it's not hugely prevalent in the cases that have come through the helpline, but 
that's not to say it may just be that that's not the issue that that victims are necessarily talking to us about it might be more immediate issues about their their safety and putting in place um, measures to keep them safe and um and so on but we do absolutely know as i said and it also may be that they're not always aware of some of the online behaviors that are being perpetrated against them because as we've said um stalkers are very adept at um you know hiding some of their behaviors and perpetrating harm um without necessarily being identified so i think there's probably a bit of a, a combination there um but as i said uh, in that case study i mean that the range of tools by which a stalker can use online methods technologies platforms means of communication um the accessing of accounts impacting somebody financially it's just so enormous uh, and I completely agree with Emma that more needs to be done to not only understand the scale at which this is going on but also how best um, can these crimes be investigated and recognised um, within the law and again it come back, comes back to that impact on the victim that absolutely needs to be taken into consideration when considering these behaviours um, as um, you know part of the stalking, the stalking law essentially. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you both. Uh, I won't take any more time on this panel. Um, if you have any other questions, please type them there and we'll try to, to answer to those questions separately. Thank you. Over to you, Julia. Thanks so much to the panels for raising so many important issues. I think not least the, the devastating impact on victims you know, of image-based sexual abuse and uh, indeed online stalking. And I wanted to move over to uh, my colleague, Professor Sonia Livingston from the LSE to um, give us some summarising thoughts. Thanks, Sonia. Thank, thank you so much, um, Julia. And um, actually, I'm glad that you uh, made the point, uh, Julia, about um, the the suffering we've heard about. It's been quite an upsetting webinar in a sense of, of, of many of the issues that we've, we've, we've heard of. Um, and uh, um, I make my, my, my few remarks uh, in the context that I'm a psychologist, not a lawyer, so um, I've been learning a lot about uh, the, the, the many issues that are raised and um, um, I'm encouraged by the, the excellent progress in terms of kind of bringing together the, 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 the research, the analysis um, and the uh, various uh, legal developments. Um, I thought I'd kind of kick off by um, reflecting on that moment a few years ago when some of us in uh, UKIS were um, concerned that uh, the UK Council for then Child um, Internet Safety was dropping the sea of child and becoming the UK Council of Internet Safety. Um, and there was a debate then about whether um, this um, move would result in the loss of attention to children um, or whether um, there would be benefits actually for everybody um, if um, all the different kinds of risks that affected people were kind of brought under one um, umbrella and the entire population was, was addressed. And um, even though at the time I was worried, and of course I remain worried about um, uh, attention to children, actually I'm, I'm very struck by the synergies across the different, um, you know, the many groups in society who, who are um, affected by various forms of online harm um, and I'm uh, encouraged by the, the sense that um, bringing together the different experts um, uh, adds impetus, I think, for attention to, to all. Um, but I did think there were some things that we learned um, and have learned in researching children and online harm that I haven't uh, heard so much about today. And it's almost kind of there in the in the in the structure of the the webinar, thinking um, first about um, intimate in image abuse and then about online stalking, um, because I think a lot of the the research on children and online harms has sought ways to kind of think holistically about um, the, the, the person, the victim, the word that we've, we've heard a lot about um, this afternoon, um, in ways that recognise um, uh, how, uh, how risks are intercorrelated, you know, in, in, in social science language, how those who experience one risk are more likely also to be at risk of others. Um, and that works in the online world and we i think we've, we've had some hints of that especially in the in the case studies that um 
uh, being subject to or victim of one risk means that you might experience others online and also offline. Um, and um, perhaps something that we haven't uh, heard uh, really today, but in relation to children, um, uh, and especially in relation to kind of peer abuse and cyberbullying, there is quite a lot of talk also about offenders also being victims. And I think that's a kind of an interesting um, thing to consider in, in, in today's um, debate where we've had quite a kind of, um, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to point to some of the kind of everyday circumstances. And as a psychologist, perhaps that's my bent, but I'm kind of thinking, you know, how do these situations arise? And uh, why is it in a way that the, the interventions only come kind of too late and rather late in, 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 in the process? Um, so I, I maybe the next step for the, the kind of work that we've heard of today is going to be to kind of begin to uh, recognise um, the array of risks that are uh, of harm that are affecting people holistically and how some people will be victims of uh, multiple and compounded um, um, harms. Uh, and I think once we make that move, then we begin to dis disaggregate the notion of victim. And what we've again heard about today, you know, is 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 victims um, as a fairly kind of generic group, um, gendered, um, pretty much um, from what I've what I've learned. Um, but I think taking going further in terms of disaggregating or thinking about uh, vectors of difference and especially vectors of disadvantage is going to be important when we start to develop um, training uh, resources and for the professionals who are necessarily engaged um, uh, and um, uh, thinking about the kind of tailored responses that are going to be needed once we kind of grasp um, the, the scale of the of the challenge. Um, and then maybe um, my very last comment might be to say something about um, technology. Um, I think we've heard a lot about um, victims and suffering and a lot about the law and its potential, of which I'm, I'm um, optimistic. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? When if, if this were a webinar about um, online harms for children, we would have been hearing a lot about um, social media companies, um, uh, the struggles that the state has in kind of um, legislating effectively um, and gaining compliance from um, the, the various technical, technological and platforms and services. And I'm intrigued that they haven't figured very much here. And maybe that's a good thing because we just go straight to the law and um, bring, the, um, bring some um, beneficial consequences. But maybe again, it's missing a trick because what we see in relation to children is that there are some very real questions, not of law um, or research, but of political will to ensure that the regulators are effective and that the um, police are um, sufficiently resourced in relation to evidence gathering, ad addressing the companies um, and so forth. So I'm just I'm just kind of intrigued at some of the, the differences in the debate, um, uh, which brings um, both strengths and weaknesses, ultimately, I hope, um, uh, strengths, but I think there's, there's, there's definitely further to go, as everyone has said. So thank you, and thank you for all your insights. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. And um, it leaves me to, to conclude, but I, I just wanted to reflect very briefly on what Sonia said, because I was thinking the same. In a sense, I kind of straddle both camps because I've worked extensively with adults and uh, offenders but I've also worked extensively with children and child victims and um, I was thinking earlier in the discussion when uh, for example Claire was talking about a kind of holistic approach I was thinking you know in the child context we'd be talking about social solutions for example you know and the role of the, the tech companies here so what about interventions prevention educational awareness and, and I guess that for me was the bit of the discussion that was missing, but I think perhaps mm -hmm. that's a topic for another time, maybe the topic for another webinar. But uh, I wanted to conclude by thanking you all for your input. I think it's been a, a great discussion and uh, thank you on behalf of the UKIS Evidence Group and the DCMS. And uh, I hope we can meet and continue the discussion soon. Thank you also to Elna for organizing and to Ruby uh, working behind the scenes. So thanks to everyone and I hope you enjoyed the discussion.
Thank you. Perfectly on time as well, Julia. <laughs> well done. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, I'm going to um, close this webinar now and end the recording. Thank you Thank all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.